By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the 93-94 Highlander Tournament right here on Timmy Talks. We have reached my final match in the group stages. This is match number four. The previous three matches, I've won two of them. I've lost one of them. And I think if I win this one against Emmanuel, he's playing red and blue. If I win this one, I probably will qualify for the top 16. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed here. Really hope that my red green took near deck can give me the victory and that I can advance here to the top 16. I'm really enjoying this Highlander tournament. And here you can see the points list that we've used for this tournament because of course the original Canadian Highlander list also has a points system. So we decided to adopt that system, but then of course make some changes because this is Highlander 93, 94. So of course there are some changes. And in the left top corner, you can see the sets that are legal for this uh, event. Of course, it is a singleton event, right? Highlander, so 100 card singleton. It's, it's been a joy to play. Now, before I start with the deck decks of uh, both of these decks, I would first like to point out that you can always choose to first skip this section of the video, maybe check it out afterwards. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games, so click on there and it'll take you straight to the games. And here I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I'm actually going to take a look at the deck of Manuel first. Let's take a look at his Red uh, Blue Brew. And here you can see some of the cards in the deck of Manuel. So I don't have a deck photo, unfortunately, but I do have a pretty good idea about the deck. And I thought these cards really illustrate what his deck wants to do, right? Because when you're thinking red and blue, you may be thinking counter burn or, you know, an aggro strategy, you know, with, with little flyers like Goblin Balloon Brigade, Flying Man, Surrender Pafrit. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, use some use some direct damage to finish the job. That could have been an option, but he really went for the longer game and for the control game. And that really shows with, I feel, these cards. Like you see Protocol Sorcerer, Brothers of Fire, a card I play with as well. So that's kind of that pinging strategy, getting value on the board. He's playing with Force Field here. Force Field, of course, a pretty expensive artifact to cast. But once it's on the battlefield, it's great to kind of make sure you don't take too much damage from those big creatures, right? You only take one damage if you pay one uh, per unblockable creature, which is which is pretty sweet, right? Um, and then there, there are also some nice combos in the deck. I know that he's also playing with Candelabra of Taunus, for example, so he probably wants to do some stuff with that. Perhaps he's also playing with a Mana Flare in that so that he can build a Candle Flare strategy. Um, but we also see Smoke and Flood here, which I think is pretty cool. Smoke is a card you don't see that often anymore. It's an enchantment, and it reads, each uh, player may only untap one creature during the untap step. So that's pretty cool, right? It's kind of like a Winter Orb, but then for creatures. And then, of course, we also have Flood, and that goes together quite well because Flood it is, is an enchantment from the dark. And for two blue, you can tap target non-flying creatures. So it has to be non-flying. So I wonder, Manuel, if you're also playing with Gravity Sphere, that would kind of be uh, be cool. That would kind of finish that, that combo off. So I'm just excited, you know, to see people playing with these cool cards. Maybe he's also playing with like... Um, uh, the, 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 the river, you know, that you've got to choose a side. What's the name of that card again? I'll, I'll show it on the screen. I, I forgot the name of the card. So stupid, but it's a beautiful card. Hoping to see that too in your deck, Manuel. Um, I'm just looking forward to, to sling spells against you. And, uh, you know, it is the last match in the group stages, as I said, in the, in the intro. So it is quite important. Um, as, as far as, you know, online magic goes, I guess. But I really want to win this. I got to be honest. I want to win this. I want to make it into top 16. So I'm also kind of scared of your deck because I think if the game is going to take longer, uh, you can win. And we've seen uh, in the match of last week that I really can get into trouble against these more controlling decks, even though in general, I think my deck should go faster. But, you know, decks don't always work the way you want them to work, do they, right? It's not cut and dry. You cannot say, okay, I've got so many two drops in my 100 card deck, so I'm probably going to draw one at turn two or turn three and put some pressure on. You know, it just doesn't work that way in uh, in magic. Anyway, this is the deck of uh, Manuel, or at least what we know of the deck of Manuel. And now let's take a look at my deck. Welcome to the Ether. And here we see my deck, Welcome to the Ether, and that is a reference to Tuknir Deathlock, a card that's also in this deck. Actually, the deck is built around Tuknir, uh, my idea of, of making the deck started with this card. So this is a 2-2 flyer, a legendary creature, 
and uh, it's actually an explorer of the ether if you read the flavor text and what i really like about this is that it has like a mini giant growth on there right i can pay a green a red and a tap and then target creature gains plus two plus two until end of turn so i think that's quite sweet there are a few tricks in the deck with the, the Tukneer, for example, Dwarven Warriors, I can make a creature unblockable, then pump it later with the Tukneer, or um, I also have, for example, Tracker in the deck, so I can make it a 4-4, and then it can kill out a bigger creature, but I mean, above all, I think, you know, a 2-2 flyer that can pump another creature could be useful in this deck. When we're looking uh, at the strategy of this deck, by the way, it's really your red-green strategy, right? So it is an aggro deck uh, that wants to just wants to have the perfect curve, the first three, four turns, all I really want to do is play a creature and turn a creature sideways. Play a creature, turn a creature sideways, right? I really try to swarm my opponent by playing out all my creatures. And if the game takes longer than expected, I can always win it with an X spell, right? I'm playing Fireball, this Integrate, Dwarven Catapult, Earthquake. Uh, I'm playing with, uh, with Hurricane. I'm playing with Detonate. So th the first goal is to start of the game, I'm going to try to deploy my creatures, like I said deal some damage and then finish it off with direct damage. Now, if that plan doesn't work, I do have a few like bigger creatures in the deck, a bit more controlling creatures like a cockatrice, like a thicket basilisk, uh, also the killer bees, which is a gr great way to sink my mana in. I'm also playing with a two headed giant. So it's not all small stuff. I'm also playing with some bigger creatures so that later in the game, I also have a chance to kind of, to kind of win and it, it's not an, an auto loss if the game takes a little bit longer. Uh, another card I really like talking about the long game is a Thelonite Druid, which is a 1-1 one, one for 1 green and 2 from Fallen Empires. And I can tap the Druid, sacrifice a creature, and then all my forests turn into 2-3 creatures, which I think is kind of cool. I think this is one of the, the stronger cards that you don't see that often, but it can really win you the game uh, out of nowhere. Now, um, maybe it's also good to kind of mention how I spent my points, so you can spend 10 points on the um, cards with points on them. And I've chosen to go for uh, Mox Emerald, Mox Ruby, and Soul Ring. So I really went for the Mana Ramp. The decision, um, I, I did that because I just want to go really quickly. I want to be able to just play everything out. And also I, I figured out that looking at the amount of X spells I have in my deck, the Soul Ring could be really, really good later in the game because yeah, it just adds those two points of damage to your Disintegrate or your Fireball or whatever X spell you're playing. So. I think it's kind of good. It was a tough choice though, because I think that, for example, a Library of Alexandria would have been quite good in here. And there are, there are some other choices that I could have made, but I really chose to go with uh, the uh, the mana ramping uh, kind of plan. So I thought, you know, let's just go for the two mocks and, uh, and the soul ring. Anyway, this is uh, the deck that I'm playing with today. We talked about the deck of my opponent and that means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. So on the left, we have Manuel with his 100 card Highlander Singleton deck. So he's playing red and blue. And uh, I'm sitting on the right playing my red and green Tuknir deck. So we're both playing a 100 card Singleton deck. And uh, yeah, this is exciting. Group match number four here for me. If I win this, I'm probably going to go to the uh, to the top 16. We see Manuel, by the way, taking a mulligan, going down to six cards in hand. And I'm starting here the game with an Asp, a 1-1 one, one, uh, creature from Arabian Nights. There's a Candelabra of Taunus by Manuel. And let's see, of course, I'm swinging in first. So going to put Manuel on 19 and he also gets a counter. And he has to pay one mana before his next upkeep or the end of his next upkeep or else he takes an extra point of damage. So Manuel will have to make a decision next turn if he wants to use that mountain to get rid of that uh, counter. But remember, I haven't played out a land yet. So now going into my second main, playing a mountain. What am I going to do here? Oh, there's a Curd Ape. Now, this is really a good opening. This is what my deck wants to do. You know, the first few turns, I really want to put pressure on, play a creature out every single turn and turn them sideways. And this Curd Ape is ideal because they also have a forest. So, I mean, this is a 2-3 creature. Probably picked it up from the top or else I would have played it uh, as my uh, first creature, as my first turn creature, I mean. Manuel playing another mountain and passing the turn. He has paid for the Asp counter, by the way. So now he's taking three points of damage. He's going to drop to 16. Another counter on the Asp. Let's see what I can do. Do I have more lands or more creatures? Or perhaps both. There is a mountain. Could now play out possibly a Brothers of Fire, a Granite Gargoyle, or of course, an Elvish Archer. It's a two drop, but it's a good one. A 2-1 first striker. So more pressure on the board. 
Next turn, I can attack for five, put Manuel on 11. But, you know, maybe Manuel draws into an Earthquake that can deal a lot of damage. Anyway, he's paying the one here for the Asp and taking on his turn, finding an island from the top. Let's see what he can do. Tapping three here. Ooh, there's a Prodigal Sorcerer, the Tim. That is not great for me. This Tim can, of course, kill my Archer and my Asp. Cannot kill the Curd Ape. It's too big at the moment, but this is a problem. Hopefully, I've got some burn to kill the Tim. Attacking here, of course, with everything is probably just going to take the damage here. Exactly going to take the damage. Drop to 11. Again, gets that counter from the Asp. Tapping two, tapping three. Do I have something against the Tim? I've got a Wheel of Fortune. Okay, wow. That's exciting. Look at what I'm losing, though. And Manuel there losing a Boomerang. That's one of the cards. I also saw a Reconstruction. And I'm losing a Spitting Slug. Of course, I didn't have to two green to cast it. And uh, I think I saw a Maze of If. And also a Storm Seeker, which can be quite good later in the game. Actually, Storm Seeker is really nice to draw into after a Wheel of Fortune. Anyway, finding a Forest here. Playing out a Forest as my land drop passing the turn. And um, yeah, Manuel now has a fresh 7. And of course, he drew a land for turn. The question is, is he going to pay here for the Asp? He's not going to pay, so he's going to drop to 10. I mean, that's what I like about the Asp, you know? Sometimes you deal an extra point of damage, which is quite nice. Feels like bonus damage, but it is quite annoying for the opponent. And remember, you have to make the decision before you draw your card, because it's in your upkeep. So Manuel now playing out another island, four lands there. Probably going to keep the Tim untapped until my combat step. Tapping two red. And a blue. And then I guess he's going to use... Is he using the Candelabra for something? Not quite sure what's happening, but... It looks like he's going to play a Chain Lightning, and he's going to fork the Chain Lightning. Okay, so he used his Candelabra for the blue mana to uh, untap a red. But of course, he should tap the, uh, the Candelabra if he does. So yeah, now he does the, the thing. And look at this. He's killing all my creatures. Wow. That is not great for me. I was in a, in a really good shape, but now all my creatures are gone. The good news is that uh, Manuel's life total, of course, is halved. And I have seven cards now, so let's see what I can do. Also, that Flood can be quite annoying. A card from uh, the Dark, an enchantment. Two blue, tap target, non-flying creature. I mean, I need to play something out, right? Hopefully, I've got like a Cockatrice or something. That would be quite ideal. Having a flyer and if Biff a Freed would be even better. Let's see what I can do. Dragon Whelp would be nice. Tapping four here. There's a Dragon Whelp. Okay, that's pretty good. Two, three creature flying, so he cannot tap it with the Flood. And I can pump it up as well. For one red, I can give it plus one, plus oh, so it has fire breathing. And you can do it up to three times. Make it into a five, three. If you do it more than that, it destroys itself at the end of the turn. And Manuel here finding another island. Tapping two blue. Are we going to see a bounce spell, perhaps? We know the boomerang is in the yard. Ooh, there's a force field. This is quite good, this force field. He can pay one for each unblocked creature and only take one damage from that. This is really good. Oh, man. I was so looking forward to just attack here with the whelp, deal some serious damage, but I guess it's not going to happen. Only going to deal one. And look at that. Manuel keeping two blue open. That is kind of risky. Really pretending at least to have a counter spell here. Attacking with the whelp. But he is going to pay the one here. So now I know that he cannot counter anymore. Only taking one damage. Drop to nine. Second main. What am I going to do? Tapping three. Do I have a Brothers of Fire perhaps? Oh, this is really nice. Brothers of Fire. Card from the dark. I can pay two red and one to deal one damage to any target and one damage to myself. And of course I can use that Brothers to kill the Timmy on the side of Manuel. Meaning I can start playing out my One Toughness creatures. And I've got quite a lot of One Toughness creatures, you know, with my color combination and my strategy. Okay, there's a Strip Mine. Not really worried about that. But he's got a lot of mana, so I'm quite worried about playing a bigger creature. Tapping four here, it seems. Untapping again. What does he want to do?
Looks like he's putting his hand away, but now picking it up again. Is he going to play something out? That's the big question. I mean, he's got enough mana to play cards out like Air Elemental, even if there's enough mana for a Mamo to Jin. I mean, I don't know if it's in his deck, but that would be quite the game changer. Perhaps he's looking something up here. Okay, he is going to use his Strip Mine. Going to take care of a Mountain. That makes sense, of course, because remember, the Brothers of Fire is two red and one to activate. So now I don't have that second red anymore, so I cannot kill the Tim. So this makes perfect sense here from Manuel. Looks like he's going to tap three as well to play something out. Four, perhaps. What are we going to see? A clone. Ooh, he's going to clone the Tim. Oh, man, this is really bad. He's got two Tims on the battlefield. He can start killing my Brothers of Fire next turn. This is really bad. Can I find another red? Because then I can kill one of the Tims and I'm kind of in the safe zone again. Remember, the clone Tim, of course, has summoning sickness. What can I do here? Five cards in hand. Really in the tank. And the fact that I have to think so much, does it mean that I don't have that second red? I guess it does. Tapping four here. There's a disintegrate. Am I going to go for the life total? No, I'm going to go for the Tim. Interesting that I'm paying so much mana if I'm going to go for the Tim. Attacking with both here. I wonder what I'm playing around that I'm tapping three mana that I'm tapping out completely. There is a ping. Okay, so he's going to block and deal the damage, killing my Brothers of Fire. And then, of course, paying one for the force field. So going down to eight. So at least I managed to get rid of both the Tims. Ooh, and this is really nice. A desert in combination with the Candelabra of Tannis is pretty sweet. Ooh, there's a Gauntlet of Chaos. So Gauntlet of Chaos is a card from Legends. And you can swap a, a land or a creature, I believe. Or was it an artifact? It's a pretty cool card. And I believe it's also 5 to use, so he cannot use it straight away. So passing the turn here also doesn't have a creature to trade. There's actually nothing here on the board for him. I, I believe Gauntlet of Chaos is uh, for an artifact or a land. Tapping a green here. There's a Concordant Crossroads. Does that mean that I have another creature to attack with? Probably do, or else I wouldn't play out the Crossroads. There's a Gargoyle swinging in for four. Oh, look at this. He can use Candelabra of Tanis. But he doesn't have enough mana to untap it, so he can only use, in this case, his uh, Force Field once. So you just take one damage from the Whelp and then two damage from the Gargoyle. Take five, or, or go down to five. I mean, take three damage in total. What I, what I thought for a moment is that he could use untap his desert with the Candelabra and deal two damage to the Granite Gargoyle. But of course, he only had that one desert uh, open. All the other mana was completely tapped because of that Gauntlet of Chaos that he played out. There's a tap for three. Ooh, there's a Sister of the Flame. Two, two from the dark. Tap for one red. But it's, it's looking difficult here for Manuel. I mean, he's on five. Next turn, I can swing in with both of my flyers. And then, of course, he can use the force field. But then he still takes two points of damage. He would go down to three. And that against the red deck with some burn, that's uh, very, very tricky. There we see Manuel tapping three here. Two blue and one. It seems or not. And he is playing a Brothers of Fire. Yeah, he can do that, of course, with the Candelabra of Tanis. So this is quite nice for Manuel, but I mean, maybe it's a little bit too little too late. Remember, Brothers of Fire, you can use it for two red and one to deal one damage to any target, but you also take a damage. So that's, that's not great for Manuel here. I think in this case, he's just another body on the battlefield. Now remember, I still have that Concordant Crossroads, so I can attack straight away. Ooh, there's a Dwarven Catapult for four, meaning two damage to both creatures. Ooh, this is really bad for Manuel. Perfect Dwarven Catapult here. A card from uh, Fallen Empires, an instant. And it's kind of like a fireball, um, but it's um, 
divides the damage, you deal with it equally among the creatures of your opponent. So you don't really have a choice. So in this case, I'm playing it for four. That means two damage on both creatures of Manuel. Manuel here making an extra mana to pump into the force field. So at least that's going to save him some damage. Attacking here, meaning he only takes three damage instead of four. So he's going to drop to two. But it's, ooh, it's not looking great for Manuel here. He's been under constant pressure. And that's, of course, a problem for him. Nope, that's it. I'm going to win the game here. So winning game number one. But, of course, not the match yet. This is just game number one. So we are going to go and shuffle up. And we will catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So Manuel on the play, of course, after losing that first one. Starting here with a mountain and a pass turn. So both of us keeping our hand. So six cards in hand for Manuel. Eight for me now after the draw. Let's see what I can do. Do I have another turn one play? That's the question. There's a Pendlehaven and a turn one play. And it's really good, of course, with that Pendlehaven. I've got a Scavenger Folk. And I can make it a 2-3 with the Pendlehaven. So that's a damage for Manuel incoming next turn. Does he have an answer to it? There's a Strip Mine. Lots of glare, but that was a Strip Mine. Taking care of the Pendlehaven. That is pretty, uh, pretty tough for me. Pendlehaven, one of the best lands I have in, uh, in this deck. There's the attack with the Scavenger Folk. Putting Manuel on 19. Not playing anything else, though. Passing the turn. Not a great turn for me here. Manuel playing... Oh, this is a smoke. So this is an enchantment, um, I believe, yeah, from the core set. And what it says is that you can only untap one creature during your untap phase. This counts for both players. So there's the attack with the scavenger folk. Putting Manuel here on 18. And again, no play. I'm a little bit concerned here about my opening. There's a Sister of the Flame, 2-2, two, two, and taps for one red, a card from the dark. We saw that in game one as well. The art always reminds me of that uh, queen cover. There is another mountain, so two mountains and a forest. I really need to put some pressure on the board. I wonder what's in my hand. This is already a really different game than uh, game number one, where I was able to put a lot of pressure on from the start. Ooh, there's the attack. Does that mean that I've got a Giant Grove, for example, in hand? No blocks here from Manuel. And there's a Bloodlust. So dealing five points of damage, playing very aggressive here. But I think that's what my deck wants to do. Putting Manuel here on 13. And passing the turn. So if he has a land drop, cannot find any blue mana, by the way. So that's a problem for Manuel, I guess. He is playing red and blue. Tapping three red. What are we going to see? There's the force field again. So we saw that in game one as well. I wonder if he wants to attack with the Sister of the Flame or perhaps keep it on uh, blocking duty. Looks like he's keeping it as a blocker, realizing that he's more the control player in this matchup. I think that's a good decision by Manuel. Let's see if I can play another land. Okay, there's a forest. And again, attacking here. So really, am I bluffing now? Manuel paying the one red to only lose one life to it. Taking a damage here, going to go down to 12. And look at that, passing the turn. So I've got nothing else to do here. Wow. I mean, it is pretty cool to see that I've managed to deal 8 points of damage with one scavenger folk. But I mean, it's also a little bit concerning for me. There's the attack probably here. Or is he tapping it for mana? Nope, he's attacking me, putting me on 18, going in the second main. There's the Candelabra of Taunus. So we see that card coming back as well. Now remember, I still have the Scavenger Folk. So whenever I want to, I could sack it, of course, to destroy an artifact. For example, the Force Field. But right now, there's no reason for me to. My only pressure on the board is that one Scavenger Folk. And attacking with it here. Manuel again paying the one for the Force Field. Taking a damage. He's now on 11. It's kind of hard to see, but he's on 11 at the moment. So his life total almost halved. There's the Asp, a card we also saw in game one that actually did some work. That was my uh, turn one play in, uh, in the previous game. Now Manuel has found an island. Remember, with the Candelabra of Taunus, he can also untap the island again. So basically, he's got two blue now. Can he do something with it? That's the big question. This could be a turning point in the match. He's still on 11. If he can now make a good play, then... It's, look, it's looking really good for him. He is in the tank here, thinking about what to do. 
Ooh, passing the turn. That's really good news for me, I think. Of course, his deck uh, probably has a lot of instants uh, in the in the in the hundred card deck there, playing a red and blue. There's a mountain, so I've got six mana here. I mean, I do play with some bigger creatures like the two-headed giant, the Urnum Jin, the If Biffer Freet. I could really use those creatures right now to put some more pressure on Manuel. Looks like I'm really in the tank here, contemplating what to do. I am expecting uh, an attack here from my side, perhaps just with the Asp. Look at that, attacking with the Asp. Not with the Scavenger Folk, that's interesting. Just with the Asp. He is blocking now. There's a Giant Grove. So I did have that Giant Grove trying to kill here the Sisters of the Flame. There's a Spell Blast though. So that's not going to happen. So I'm going to lose the Asp here to the 2-2 creature. What am I going to do in my second main? Ooh, look at that. I'm going to use the Scavenger Folk. Does that mean that perhaps using it here on the uh, Candelabra of Tana is interesting? He's untapping the blue, so perhaps he's got a Power Sink, for example. Passing the turn here. Wow. Interesting moves. I thought maybe I've got an Earthquake, or perhaps next turn I want to play an Earthquake. But then again, I could have kept the scavenger folk and did it on end step of manuel here so i wonder what i was thinking anyway there's the attack for two probably gonna exactly drop to 16 untapping here so quite lucky that manuel's not doing anything or am i lucky though because perhaps it means he's got more counter magic in hand almost tapping out completely tapping six Ooh, there's a triskelion are we gonna see a counter spell here power sink would be devastating for me at this stage Manuel kind of needs it though. You know, a shatter would also be quite good for him. There's an unsummon. Ooh, that's not ideal because with the unsummon, of course, I can deal three damage to him too. If I want to, there on the Sisters of the Flame and one to Manuel or just uh, three to the face in total. So this unsummon is really kind of desperation mode, I feel. Because remember, it's going to go back to my hand so I can recast it next turn and then it'll have those three counters again. Manuel now on eight. And perhaps he's hoping to draw into counter magic. There's the attack. The sister is also doing work. I have to admit that. I believe she's done six points of damage so far this game. I'm on 14. But I'm probably just going to recast the Triskelion. Keeping a green open here, it seems. Tapping the green. Ooh, no. I thought for a moment there it was a Concordant Crossroads, but it's a Birds of Paradise 01 flyer. You can tap it for any color of mana. Let's see what Manuel can do here. Four mountains and a, an island. Looks like I'm going through my graveyard. Just a pass from Manuel. I wonder what's in his hand. Nothing useful, I guess. Just passing here, which is ideal for me. I can now start attacking with the trike. It's exactly what I do. He's going to use the force field. But it still means he loses a life, though. He's going to drop to seven. Ooh, look at this. Tapping everything. There's a fireball. Is that it? Oh, that's it. Oh, I couldn't play out that counter spell because I used that scavenger folk here against the uh, the candelabra of Tana's meaning. I take the victory here, and that means my third win in the group stages. I mean, that is pretty amazing. Oh man, I'm so happy with this because it means I'm qualified here for the top 16. So I'm gonna continue to the top 16. And if you wanna uh, be part of that journey make sure to come back here next week again because then i will show you my uh, top 16 match and here you can see the deck of my opponent uh, the uh, the deck that i'm going to play against next week so if you don't want to miss a thing make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell and if you're already 
a subscriber. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for, uh, for watching the videos, supporting the channel that way. Please uh, also take a moment to like, share and comment on these videos. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And then of course, there's one final thing that you can do and that is become a patron of the show, just like Manuel. The cool thing is when you become a patron uh, on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks, uh, you can also join the online tournament. So I organize these online tournaments every you know month, uh, two months, three months or so. I organize an event. And of course, it's, uh, it's to thank all the patrons for their support. So if you become a patron, you can also join in, uh, in those events. And also, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Zeke!